I think what, um, what Brad just said is kind of like the, the perfect connection between the two worlds because basically what service-oriented architecture is on the system architecture level, uh, dependency injection is uh, in the software architecture level. And if you think about services in terms of network services, right, um, you can kind of think about it the same way in, inside one process in, in terms of dependency injection services. And in a very concrete way, if you have this kind of modularity, you can actually have a PH, pure PHP implementation of a service that you use internally, service object, um, or that can just be a thin layer uh, that talks to a remote service. Um, giving you an interface or an abstraction layer uh, where you can actually incorporate the best of both worlds. Um, that's at least my hope. What, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> is there? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> So can I just use? Uh, yeah, arrow keys. Arrow. Yeah. It's also. <laughs> it's work. Can I just scroll <laughs> somehow? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Technology. Okay, that works. Um, so the rationale behind uh, using dependency injection is basically the same as for a service-oriented architecture. Uh, you want to avoid strong coupling. You want to rely on well-defined interfaces between services on different levels. Um, that allows development to be decoupled, that allows uh, better testability, especially in, in terms of automated testing. And it makes it easier to reuse individual components. So um, the idea is to move the software architecture towards something where you have, on the one hand, service objects that are, uh, well, I put singletons into quotes because uh, a true singleton can actually only exist once in a process. That's not actually what I'm aiming at, and that's actually uh, not best practice. But a situation where you would typically have just one instance of a service. Um, or you could, that doesn't mean one instance of one type of service, but or I don't know, you could have two rendering services implementing the same interface for different purposes and have them coexist, something like that. Uh, so on the one hand you have service objects, on the other hand you have rather dumb and simple value objects, and really not much in between. Um, of course there's always exceptions, and uh, it's not something that you would you know, insist on, on to always be handled this way 100% especially not during transition, especially not if you're trying to move a big complex system like MediaWiki towards more modular architecture. Um, yeah, in concrete terms, in, to, uh, in the context of a storage layer, this kind of corresponds to the uh, data access object approach, um, which I hope to move towards with MediaWiki. Um, yeah, in order to avoid strong coupling, uh, the idea is that the service object would always get whatever it needs to operate as constructor parameters, and you have some kind of service at the top that um, glues these services together, that wires them. So uh, you have a top level thing, a, a DI container typically. Uh, or a service lo locator, depending on the termino terminology you want to use, that knows which services use which other service implementation. So the concrete implementation is known in like one place. Um, there actually seemed to be, there was an RFC discussion about this recently, and another one like maybe a year ago, and there seemed to be a broad consensus that yes, we want to move in that direction, but there were also a couple of open questions. Um, one of them is, in how far should the DI container be configurable? So should extensions be free to define their own services or even override and replace or wrap existing service objects? Um, 
which would actually be very powerful, right? An extension could simply completely replace the entire storage layer of MediaWiki. And everything would then operate on the storage layer that the extension uh, provides. That's a very, f that makes it very powerful. Um, maybe scary, I don't know. I kind of like the idea. Um, then there's the aspect of auto wiring. So a lot of DI frameworks have the ability to automatically guess what service implementation another service needs ba just based on the interfaces that are implemented. Um, a lot of people are worried of that. And I agree, this is very convenient until the system gets so complex that you no longer know what's going on. So I personally much prefer to explicitly say which service uses, so which service implementation uses which other implementations and when. And the last question um, that seemed to be open is, shall we use a pre-existing third-party framework for this or should we roll around? And in my opinion, most of the existing frameworks simply do too much. We really need only very, very basic registry thing that can be implemented in 200, 300 lines of code. And I personally think that um, it's simply not worth the pain of relying on, on the third party library. But that's one of the um, open questions still. So maybe I can get some feedback on the general idea of moving towards using um, server, service objects and using dependency injection in general, and also some feedback on these questions. Thanks. Stunned silence. So I guess maybe first just a um, show of hands here, like h how many people here feel like they understand the questions that are being put to them? Like raise a show of hands here, like how many people feel like, and then how many people maybe are still confused? Not willing to admit it, okay. <laughs> got, got sort of, okay. Um, Okay. Yeah, of course. If you're still confused, feel free to ask questions. So I'm, I will try to explain. Yeah. Not particularly confused. Just uh, wanted to add a comment since you have an open question. Um, so in terms of DI container, uh, one model I've seen in the past for DI injection, uh, particularly currently in use in Flow, which is something I would recommend we try to avoid for Minduki Core, which is where you have global variables that you then import into different scopes as a singleton, rather more the contextual-based approach. I'm not sure what uh, your thoughts on that are. I would recommend to avoid access to, sta to static variables wherever we can. We have quite a few uh, what I would call static entry points in, in MediaWiki, uh, in particular, um, hook handler functions that are used by extensions typically are static functions. So they would have to access something from static, the, the global scope. Um, or from parameters. From, sorry? Or from parameters. Or from parameters, yes. Uh, but in order to use that, we ha would have to modify all the hook signatures. That would be painful. So at least for the backwards compatibility, uh, my suggestion would be to um, keep hook handler functions very, very simple and basic, make them access like the global service locator object, get whatever they need from that, and then um, instantiate what, or well, use something, some service to do the actual handling. Uh, we have very good experience, we have made very good experience with this approach in, in Wikidata. We use it all over the place and it works very, 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 very well. It allows you to actually test the handler code completely independently of, of MediaWiki core. So I think I can at least talk to two of these three questions. So the third one, whether or not we should use or avoid frameworks for this. Like if you've done the surveying of the, the frameworks that exist in PHP for this right now, and you say they're kind of overkill or whatever, like then my inclination would be to not use them. Like we don't, there's no point in injecting like a pile of code that we only end up using a fraction of, you know, like it's just a waste, you know, tons of overhead if, if cognitive, if nothing else. Um, my question would be on the auto wiring though is from my brief looking at it, 
the way that people in PHP tend to do auto wiring is via reflection. And I'm curious if the overhead from having to use reflection to to do that auto wiring ends up it ends up negating like some of the, like you end up you know you end up with cleaner code that it's easier to to introspect and to to test and so forth. But like, have you added an overhead that that's unacceptable in a production environment? And that would be my biggest concern with auto wiring. Like, because like I guess the the biggest comparison would be like in Java, like you can do it and it's done like prior to runtime versus mm -hmm. like with PHP reflection, like you can't do it until runtime happens and it's kind of a pain at that point. And it happens on, well, not for every service on every request, but to some extent it would happen on every request, on every every time we hit an application server. Yes. Um, the original DI RFC that we discussed like a bit over a year ago, um, suggested an auto-wiring mechanism and actually implemented it by hand. And uh, one of the main, major objections back then was also performance. And that's also one of my big concerns. The other big concern about auto-wiring is, well, basically too much magic. You cannot actually look at the code and see what is done there. It's all kind of magically matching types somehow. So in that case, like I, I think from what we're saying now and then you know, the, the objection that we had when we talked about this last time, my inclination would be that we would avoid auto wiring it. Like it's too, it's too magical and, and the performance implications are very real um, with reflection in PHP. So I, I would be, you know, inclined to avoid it. Um, you know, it, it's certainly nice, like it's, it certainly can be nice um, and, and makes for quick writing of code, but you know, the, the magic, it's a little scary sometimes and can be hard to wrap your head around when you're looking at a, a, a fresh, you know, batch of code that you've never worked on before and you're kind of wondering like where are these things actually coming from? Yeah, I completely, I, I personally agree. I would also add to that, we've had to remove various calls to reflection in the PHP code base over the past few months uh, for various performance reasons. Sorry. Uh, don't use it, please. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. Shall I go back to the etherpad so you can see what's happening? Just for clarification, having not uh, programmed too much, I wonder if you could give a case example that might use a Wikidata and also uh, with an interlingual uh, component to those three elements. So I, I don't think I quite uh, got the connection between interlingual and the dependency injection bit. So can you give a case example first of uh, dependency uh, inter uh, interjection um, that be apart from the interlingual question? An example? Yep. Well, if you, for instance, have a service that provides access to an underlying storage system, so something like a service that has something like, okay, get me revision X of article Y, um, and this service, is supposed to do uh, permission checks, then the service would not implement these permission checks itself, and it would not instantiate whatever is needed to do the permission checks itself. It would ask the, um, it would simply ask in the constructor to get a service that does permission checks. And the idea is to build the entire software around this idea. One service does one thing and asks for other services for doing other things and does not know how these are implemented and should not know about it. That's the idea. That's it. Uh, hi. Um, my main concern is how are we actually going to get people to use this because, you know, we did title value and uh, nothing uses it realistically. Yeah. Um, well, one problem with title value, or there's several problems with title values. One is that it's not a good replacement for title because it does not have the information from the page table. Um, we would need something else to represent entries in the, in the page table. Um, title value actually has a very limited use case, which is basically link targets. It's just like a namespace and a title. Um, and the services associated with it that does the, that do the parsing and uh, link generation um, well, they are used, but they're kind of hidden because they're kind of encapsulated in, in uh, compatibility methods. Um, there is currently no good way to expose them. With the DI framework, 
you would then have a hub where you can just ask for such a service. Currently, it's rather unclear how you would get a service instance. Um, and currently, it is just, you know, if you don't have a need to use the service, um, because you can still use the old star code and it's not deprecated or anything, um, well, then, then you don't, right? Uh, I imagine that we would start using this for um, providing new functionality. For instance, if, if we um, are going to implement multi-content revisions, um, the old compatibility stuff, like the old uh, revision object and so on, would still exist, but you would only get the main slot. If you want to actually use more, you would have to use the new services. Couple questions or a couple comments, I should say. Um, so your first question about uh, should should we allow? I forget how you phrased it, but basically, should extensions be able to like replace a service? Um, just going back to history, uh, auth plugin, which was kind of a service. Um, really, it kind of worked, but it really didn't serve as well, and it became a, a real bear to uh, deal with. Um, so I, I guess yes, if we do them right, we, they should be. We should be able to to use them well, but um, unfortunately I feel like we designed them with kind of a rigid interface and then we realized that that interface doesn't work for us anymore. Um, and so I don't, uh, I guess I just caution against letting extensions um, depend on some uh, interfaces like auth plugin. I'm definitely not explaining this very well. Um, I guess I would say. Um, okay, you, you said you were to talk, well, okay, let me, you said that it is a bad idea to have extensions rely on interfaces. Uh, what else could they rely on? Sorry, uh, when when they can replace services, I guess I, I feel like our my personal experience with letting extensions replace a core service um, that then uh, has to be relied on throughout core and other extensions um, has made things difficult with auth plugins. So I think I, I would just say I vote maybe not on that one. Yeah. Okay, I see. I understand the. I mean, auth plugin is a pretty. The interface is not very well specified. Yeah, that, that there were other <laughs> issues there too. So I'm like, I, I don't know if it was interface. the implementation specifically, or whether it was a specific particular problem. I would just say, it. Uh, I feel like that seems like a bad direction to me personally. Maybe, maybe um, we could have an intermediate uh, solution where there's basically a white list of things that can be replaced by extensions. Yeah. I mean, currently, we have like a ton of hooks that allow extensions to replace all kinds of functionalities in random ways, right? right. Uh, to me, it seems like an improvement to actually have narrow interfaces with clear specifications. But yeah, I, I also understand that that can go wrong. Yeah. Um, and then my second comment, um, I, I think it would be great to, as we start doing this and as we're defining these interfaces, um, if we can document the security properties of them. I know that's been uh, a constant thing in Wikidata. Um, as you're going through, you're like, hey, I know I'm dealing with a service of this type. I don't know which concrete implementation I'm doing. So therefore, I don't know whether this is safe or not safe um, because the security mm -hmm. properties aren't documented. And that is something that I would like to figure out, whether it's like a standard documentation or whether it's um, finding some way to define that within the class itself. Um, I don't know, but. Yeah. One, one thing that is scary in terms of security um, is that if you have two services, well, one service using the other service, and both of them um, pass tests individually, but uh, the one service and the test of the one service have, are misinterpreting the spec of the other one. So maybe I, I'm getting messages from one services to use in the other, and the other service assumes they are clean HTML, but they aren't. All tests will pass, but I have an injection vector in the live system. So yes, uh, that is an issue. Uh, that we have to be very careful about. No, like, like we have ex extensions, of course, like Wikibase or other ones that like define different content types. And then within core, you have like places like recent changes or like maybe you have different types of changes or log entries or events. And then you want to like format them in the in the like special page and. It would be nice to like be able to define a, like a formatter for like the, like these new like types that like come from an extension, and just to have like interface like in core for that, 
like would be a lot like nicer, and then like extensions can implement like services or add or or replace maybe mm -hmm. like for like just different cases, um, maybe for more like critical things like I don't know maybe not so much but like there needs to be a way for like and, yeah. and going the way of like. Um, implementing an interface is, uh, tends to be like a lot nicer and easier to work with than the like, the hook like system. Mm -hmm. I think. Like I mean, we have this with Cirrus. Like it has a whole bunch of hooks that like like we can implement in Wikibase like to uh, like make it start to understand Wikibase content. But then it's like eh, like and yeah. <laughs> it's not so nice. Like, yeah, I think this is an, an important point that uh, allowing extensions to replace services means or could or provides an alternative to the current hook system that uses very, well, uh, mushy interfaces, right? You uh, don't have anything very concrete to rely on in terms of, I don't know, type checking or function signatures or anything. Oftentimes you just get an array that is passed as a reference and then you modify it somehow. Well, that's, yeah, that's kind of scary. Um, but I also like the idea or the notion that there, maybe there should be a whitelist or a blacklist of stuff that extensions can replace. Could look into that, yeah, why not? So I'd like to play devil's advocate and give a little thought exercise for replacing hooks with uh, services that can be overridden. Um, the model seems very big of an, seems, seems like a big improvement. Because for you could, for example, enforce things like private methods and static methods, and you can actually main state, you can actually maintain state within your extensions override. Whereas right now, you have to either maintain state between different hook calls, and it gets very messy very quickly. Um, an example is central auth, for example, where it's it's quite difficult for it to maintain state between the different parts of where you override the user interface. Um, on the other side, it also complicates things when you have multiple extensions trying to add functionality to the same thing. Because um, presumably the service override would extend the core class and do something with it and then set the global variable where it says instead of using this class, you now use this class. But then only one extension can realistically do that because they would need to know about each other to know which one to extend. Yeah, you can use a decorator pattern to avoid that. All right. Is, is that something we then want to encourage in PHP? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I, I would, I, I, actually I have done this in the past. So you would, in, you would replace the service, the original service object with something that actually wraps the original service object and you can stack that if you want. Cool. Uh, for uh, dependency injection regarding using a framework, going back to the open question uh, a little bit, um, I would personally think that using a library for this is probably uh, overkill, as been, has been said before, but maybe for slightly different reasons, which is that I, I see dependency injection more as a pattern than as a framework. Um, and by just setting uh, function signatures and using uh, classes that, con that, that construct objects, that is basically dependency injection. You don't need a framework to do that. Uh, that gives you a much more explicit interface and allows you to more easily document things. So. That's actually uh, what we do in, in Wikidata currently. We use dependency injection as a pattern. We do not use any framework and we don't have a DI container. Uh, we have a top level thing that has all the object, the service instantiation hard coded. But that means that uh, extensions can neither define their own services nor replace existing services uh, because there is no way to, to get in there. Um, so, but it is in, indeed true that you can think about DI as a pattern uh, separately from the, um, basically the wiring framework. Uh, these are kind of separate things even though they are often both called dependency injection. I'd, I'd like to talk about how we move forward with these various areas. So we've got the, the two areas that you've talked about today, service-oriented architecture and dependency injection is two long-standing debates um, about just how quickly we should move to them, if we should move to them, et cetera. Um, and then additionally, we've also got um, and, and the software engineering area generally is about making our software make sense to people, especially to people with a, a potentially like a computer science background, but 
but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. I think it just needs to make sense. Like this is a system worth learning rather than something that's uh, be, you, it is um, uh, a, a perilous mess that, that you want to avoid, right? Like we want to be proud of the system that we're building. We want it to make sense and we want people to be efficient in doing so. Um, so my, my question slash comment here is how do we keep this area moving forward? Like how, um, you know, in the, at one extreme we could say like, oh, we need a mailing list associated with just the software engineering area. And on the other extreme we can basically say, well, you know, we'll just have, it'll be some fabricators tax, like this will be just basically be a nebulous group that sometimes comes together at things like this. And I'm wondering, what what is the right way for this, you know, it, does this feel like a coherent area um, of interest, number one? And then number two, um, if this is a coherent area, how do we keep the collective interest and attention um, moving forward on this issue rather than dispersing when the buses come to this evening? And perhaps also, what should the role of the architecture committee be in that context? Or does it, does, does it have a role? Does it even make sense to have it? Well, so, so Greg is asking why is the architecture committee not just driving this going forward? Um, and I think the answer, um, I'll, I'll speak to this as, um, I think part of the answer to that is that the, the, the architecture committee is overseeing whether or not the various areas are actually functioning well, but, um, but there still needs to be an area to oversee. If, if it's just basically, well, the architecture committee's doing it, then it sort of lets everybody kind of off the hook and say, okay, good, the architecture committee's doing that, and <laughs> walk away. Um, yeah. Well, uh, from my perspective, we are kind of pushing that direction. I mean, that's why I'm standing here, right? And that's why Gabriel just stood here. Um, but, in terms of actually getting stuff done, right? Getting stuff written, well, we need time and resources, and these are scarce, right? And working on the architectural foundations is, well, how do you measure the impact of that? It's not going to make shiny new features tomorrow. It's going to make it easier to build shiny new features in half a year, uh, but it's still hard, it's hard to sell, and currently, um, yeah, there is no, no one in particular seems to be responsible for implementing this kind of thing. Um, I am happy to invest time when I have it, and I have written code, for instance, for dependency injection, but, well, it has been sitting there for a couple of months now because I simply don't have time to work on it. It still helps, at least, like, that we have the architecture committee and the RFC process and the meetings, so like we actually do like discuss them now, and decisions like can be made. And like um, I don't know, like I think dependency injection is one where like like as Daniel has time, or people have time, like can get refined, where like like no one has serious objections, and then I guess like can get merged or something. But like we have a process for this now, and then it's just as like. I mean, people have the time, which is a challenge, but like the process like helps a lot, and like, and I know like with things that I try to tackle, like like trying to refactor recent changes, like or, or like to make it work better, or search for Wikibase, and, and like I keep running into uh, I need like or with like dependency injection, or, or like to be able to like have services, and then there's like no like nice way to like register them or, or deal with them and so like just keep running into this and I mean at least like that's something that I, I think 
if you can get solved the soonish, I hope. And it just helps to have the process. Like. So I think a big part of what's the problem here right now is, um, like you say, it's a resourcing thing. Like I don't think I'm hearing any real objection in the room to like the ideas that we're talking about here. It's just a matter of who's going to sit down and write the code to do it. Um, you know, and, and without, you know, like you're saying, like there's nobody, nobody like truly owns like, you know, nebulous parts of core like this, like, you know, the, the wiring that kind of just holds core together, like those are just kind of weird things that nobody, nobody like truly owns it. You know, everybody uses it, but nobody, you know, works on it. And it's, and, and I wonder, you know, since we're standing here trying to figure out like, how do we resource something like this? I'm wondering if like the, the path going forward is to give the architecture committee the resources it needs to drive these sorts of things forward. Like these are things that like I feel that like the architecture committee should own, but like you say, like, you know, it's a matter of hours and day and you know, you just can't do everything. So I'm wondering if that's like an idea going forward is is giving the architecture committee, you know, both the resources and the remit to to go forward with these sorts of like nebulous core plumbing type things that nobody wants to, that, that nobody really does want to own ultimately because, you know, you're right, it doesn't lead to a shiny new feature. Um, you know, it's stuff that keeps the site running though and, and makes it easier for us to do our jobs going forward. Can I respond on the resources front? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I worry about um, is that whenever we have any sort of hard question, we say, oh, we need to throw resources at it. As if, you know, which really means like, basically make it somebody's paid job to do this thing. And that's kind of a cop out, I think, because basically, like, we don't have a huge budget to do these kind of things. And so, um, we, I think we have to work, we have to figure out like how to or both arrive. So one of the things that I was originally asking and which sort of led us down this path was like, I was asking, how do we keep this area moving forward? Because I think there are, there are things that we can be doing that don't require full-time resources, do not, do not require like, it's, oh, well, this is somebody's job to do this, like that we can, that, that we can cause um, the aggregation to happen, but, um, uh, and, and then furthermore, when we talk about things like dependency injection or service-oriented architecture or whatever, there is the, yes, we need to move towards this, and so having, um, or, or like, th there's a desire to move towards this potentially, but having, um, like, we need to also think about, like, okay, given, Given the people and time and the problems that we have now, what is the what can we do now? I think is is something we should be thinking about rather than thinking about well, sure, if we had more resources, then we'd be able to solve this problem. When, okay, but maybe as a direct response, I think one of the things that we can do is try and not make the problem worse by basically having these principles in mind and trying to write code that is. In, in a way compliant with it or at least moves into the right direction. Um, Is it, yeah, there's still three people wanting to say something. We're kind of running out of time. I don't know, um, Gabriel, do you think, do you want to do the wrap up? Shall we take more comments? I can be quick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll just be quick. Um, yeah. So I think Rubla's conclusion was correct that it is a there's priorities and there's projects we need to get done and, and there's important things that need to happen. And I think that, let's be honest, there's a, a, the, the lion's share of the development that would probably do this would come from the foundation or Deutschland and, and we just need to make it a project that a team owns for a court, whatever, like any other project proposal process that we go through. Um, we need to elevate architecture decisions to that level, I think. Um, if we keep them down here at this dev summit that not everybody comes to, where we just brush it aside as 
architecture stuff. And it doesn't get up to the same level as Flow, for instance. I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. That's it. So speaking to the resources question and also to the team autonomy question that came up in the service-oriented architecture discussion, it seems to me that we used to have a team that at least was nominally supposed to be concerned with that sort of thing, but then the giant engineering reorg of doom was trying to do more team autonomy by building these empire verticals and killing the team that was going across the verticals so they didn't have to communicate so much with anybody outside of their reporting structure. So perhaps that's something that needs to be looked at. To answer Robla's question on how do we implement this, um, from personal experience, if you want to make a large change across MediaWiki core and extensions, you need to write a patch and drive it for a few months, find someone bold enough to plus to it, and then like convert a few extensions, um, and then minus one, everyone else's patches that don't use your system. <laughs> After the wrap up. After the wrap up. After the wrap up. Well, if the, I thought the there was going to be a separate general discussion for the last few minutes, or, or no? Go. Okay. So, um, three very quick comments. One is, um, in addition to specifying what we should do in the future, we should also identify those things that we are doing right now that are working and that should be preserved and deserve continuing support. I have to say that I believe the um, RFC meetings are very useful. It's not always easy to um, precisely measure and indicate what the impact of each meeting is, but I think they do a lot to sort of um, uh, form and mold a uh, shared understanding of um, problems. And I've um, point two is uh, I know it's ridiculous to pinpoint any single person as being somehow critical to this process. But Aaron is, and he's not here because he feels um, kind of disengaged, and it's really important to reach out to him. If you look at MediaWiki specifically, um, he's kind of uh, dominated like the last couple of years' worth of um, commit activity. Uh, third and final point, I think uh, we're a bit insular when it comes to interacting with other communities um, that work on um, large, enterprisey, mature software. And um, I believe that we should, uh, when uh, uh, planning for like next year's summit and planning for hackathons and planning for from other things come. We have a good way to wrap this up. To summarize it all, the magic, magic last words. Yeah. Um, well, I think for, for services, we, we have identified quite a few uh, issues that, that have been, we've been discussing with ops, with release engineering, or with others, like their ownership. And I think we, um, we will work together to fix those. So I think we, we are on, it's good to have a session to discuss those things. Um, I don't have a magic solution about who should be responsible. I think it's, it, I'm very doubtful of any solution that pushes it to some authority. You saw this from me, especially for very cross-cutting problems that require everybody's buy-in and, and input. But um, I think the only thing that can solve that is a, is a process that involves people and goes up and down, convinces people. In my two cents. I have to say that I'm quite happy to find that uh, we seem to agree largely on the general direction to move in. I think that that's basically my, my big takeaway from, from the session. That, I mean, there's concerns, there's valid con concerns, there's open questions, um, but the general direction seems to be clear and people seem to generally agree on what that direction should be. And I'm quite happy about that.
I guess that's it, right? All right, thanks. <laughs>